love that the sun is shining bright. It's gorgeous outside. Somewhere. It's amazing. Perfect weather, really. Amen. Well, good morning, church. I just want to say welcome. If you are new with us today or if you haven't been around long, we are so happy you're here. Uh, we just want to welcome you to the Hope Church family. And, um, you know, my name is Cameron. I'm the worship pastor here. And welcome to those of us joining online. Um, God is so good. Amen. On mornings like this, it's easy to be like, oh, it's a little drudgery. It's gross outside. I don't really want to go out. It might be dangerous to drive. But what I'm reminded of is the sun is still shining. The sun is still shining. It doesn't matter what the weather is like outside. What we see in front of us sometimes can obscure what the truer reality is. And so this morning, however you're feeling, whatever the current situation that's in front of you is, know that there is a greater truth behind that. There is something going on that you might not be able to see right now. And that there is goodness, there is love, there is mercy, there is forgiveness, there is truth and beauty, all being supplied by Jesus. And that is going to be true regardless of whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. Um, and so this first song that we're going to sing, we're going to sing Graves in the Gardens. We know this song. Um, and, you know, it talks about how the Lord turns mourning, grieving, weeping into dancing. He turns ashes, he turns that into beauty, he takes shame, he turns it into glory. He turns graves into gardens. He turns bones into armies. He turns seas into highways. These are all references to different stories throughout Scripture, whether it's the Israelites going through the Red Sea, um, whether it's the, um, you know, the, the fact of Jesus coming back to life. What was a grave becomes this garden experience of new life, of new creation. And so as we sing today, as we worship, as we hear the word of God uh, preached to our hearts, I pray that we would start letting it soak in that there's a greater truth going on than the one we see before us. There is a greater truth than the one we sometimes see. So Jesus, would you start speaking? Would you start doing something fresh and new? Holy Spirit, I pray that you would open up our, our hearts and our minds, that we would hear your voice, that we would be able to feel your peace and your presence, Jesus. Lord, we love you, and it's in your name we pray. All God's people say, amen. Be back. 
response to this is real simple. We sing, Jesus, we love
yes, he died. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free. Oh, is free indeed. Who am I? I'm a child. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I'm going to sing in my father's house. In my father's house. child. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Sing in my father's house. In my father's house. There is a place. There's a place for me. I'm a child. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Father, thank you that we are your children, that we get to be secure, secure and, and confident in the fact that we belong to you. We don't have to wonder our place. We don't have to wonder our worth, our value. Lord, have your way today. I pray that we would receive your words, not as people who are far off, not as people who are scared to hear what you might have to say. But Father, that we would hear your voice and know that you speak to us in such a tender, gentle way because we are your beloved children. And you're a good father who we don't have to be afraid of. Have your way, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you turn and greet a neighbor? Let's try this again. <laughs> Sorry. Good to see everybody today. A loud church is a healthy church. If it's all quiet, then uh, something went wrong, okay? That's just it's not a good thing. Uh, so it's good to see everyone here today. Uh, it, my wife and I and my family, we all went to Florida this last week, so uh, it's great to be back. We miss you guys. Um, it's great to be able to get away for a little bit, uh, but it's also in, great to be with you guys too. That's a very big thing. Um, I want to say thank you so much to Cameron who filled in on Father's Day, Allie uh, filled in on last Sunday, 
And we had uh, Jorge that filled in uh, the last midweek, not this last one, but the week before that. And then also we had a missionary Taylor who helped out this last Wednesday. So I want to say thank you to everybody who helped out so much while we were away. And Graciela made sure the place was not burnt down. So... <laughs> so we're really happy on everything that went down. So thank you so much for all the help that went on. We also want to say, uh, for those of you who are here, if this is your first time, there's a Connect card right in the chair in front of you. You can fill that out and drop it in the uh, offering boxes in the back on your way out. That helps us to get to know you a little bit more and let you know a little bit more about us as well. Also behind that, there's a prayer request and also a praise report on the other side. So you can fill those out as well. Um, we had some uh, really big prayer requests that came in this week. And, you know, we've been really uh, going after God for those. And we're re really encouraged what God is going to do and how he's going to heal and what he's going to do. And we had some great praise reports last week, too. And uh, so we'll let you know about the praise report next week because I want to get the full thing on there. Um, but, you know, God's been doing some awesome things. So we want to encourage you to fill those out. Also, if you'd like to give, there's a couple different ways to give. You can give online. You can also uh, give in the give boxes in the back. Uh, but we're going to pray for our offering right now. God, we thank you so much, God, for how you've helped us to, God, sow into the community. God, sow into different people's lives. God, sow into missionaries. God, you've helped us to do so much more than we ever could do by ourselves. But God, you've helped us as, as a church to to have a fingerprint, God, to show your love, God, to allow people to see who you are. And God, that has been through the faithfulness and the giving of the people that are here, giving of their time, their talents, God, their, their treasure. God, we are so grateful for all they're doing. I pray that you would bless them immeasurably. We thank you so much in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, I also want to say thank you for everybody who helped out. We had a very busy week back. We came back uh, and then right away we had the parade on Thursday, and then we had a 5K yesterday morning, and there's like all kinds of stuff that was happening right in a row, but thank you guys so much for helping out in all the different areas, uh, being a part in the community. We have a couple things that are coming up uh, tomorrow. Uh, it's going to continue on prayer in the park at 7 p.m. Uh, at Hale Park. We meet by the flagpole. If you don't know what it is, talk to Jennifer New. She raised her hand right there. Uh, she'll let you know all about it. Uh, it's going to be a great time. I have not been to one. I've been, I was at the kids' camp and we were on vacation, so I haven't been to one this uh, summer, so I'm excited to be at this one tomorrow. So definitely check that out. That'll be at 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Also, uh, July 13th through the 15th. Many of you saw this on every other chair. This is not just to say, I need to move this over because this is being saved for somebody else. No, um, this is for you to be able to hand out to somebody, to pray and hand this out to someone uh, who has kids, um, and maybe you have grandkids, maybe you have some nieces or nephews or something. This is going to be an awesome opportunity for them to hear about God. And so we're doing a um, July 13th through the 15th, we're going to be meeting here. So July 13th through the 14th, it's 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. We meet here at night, then July 15th. We have a great time here from, 12, from 10 to 12. Uh, it's going to be an awesome time of letting people know who God is. How many know that's an important thing? You know, in fact, in the Bible, uh, we had some kids who came over to try to talk to Jesus, and disciples were like, no, no, he needs to talk to the adults. He doesn't have time for the kids. And uh, Jesus was not happy with that. In fact, he said he rebuked them on that. That's pretty strong language. He was not happy with that. He's like, no, 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 I want the kids to come. I care about the kids just as much as I care about the adults. So we care about the adults in this community. I think we've shown that many, many ways as a church, but how many of us know we want to show that we love the kids as well, right? That was like five. All right, we love the kids as well, right? Great. Uh, so we want to encourage you, get involved. Uh, if you'd like to help out, we could definitely use more help. Please talk to Graciela Garcia uh, downstairs, our children's director. Please talk to her after service, you can definitely utilize your help. And if you haven't registered your kids already, there's a QR code. You can register them and uh, get them all set up. That would be an excellent time as well. Uh, another thing that you could sign up to help out with is Convoy of Hope Chicago. That's going to be in Marquette Park on August 12th. And again, talking about helping with kids, uh, our church is actually going to be helping out with the kids program in there. And what does that mean? We're going to be watching inflatables, making sure kids don't die. Okay, so if you can do that. Right? That's pretty much it. Yeah, and some face paint and stuff like that. Make some balloons. I'm, I should just have you say all this. Anyway, but uh, um, if you have any questions about any of this, please talk to Caroline. Uh, you can raise your hand right there. Uh, you know, she'll let you know a little bit what's going on with that. Uh, but, you know, it's going to be an awesome time. Last time we did this, we had 12,000 people that showed up. So we need all your help. Uh, so, uh, it was an awesome time. We hand out backpacks. We do school supplies. We do shoes. We do groceries. 
uh, um, the cancer society is out there doing breast uh, cancer exams. We do uh, uh, all kinds of stuff with dental. There's haircuts. Literally, you name it, it's pretty much out there, not just for back to school, but also for job programs, veterans programs, all kinds of different stuff that we partner together with other churches and other uh, groups. And we work with this group, Convoy of Hope, which does stuff throughout the entire world uh, just to make a day great for Jesus because it all ends up at a prayer tent at the very end. So they have all these other things, and they come over to a prayer tent that they're able to have prayer. And we've seen people come to know the Lord through that. We've seen people plugged into local churches from that. We've seen a lot of stuff that God has done as a result of this. So we want to encourage you as well to get involved. So if you have any questions on that, please talk to Caroline after service, and they will let you know about what's going on. Sound good? All right. Wow, y'all got to wake up. It's like rain. It gets tired. All right. Uh, also want to let you know two last things. Um, so the youth are having a hangout today, next, next uh, Sunday, for those who are going to youth camp on the 9th, we're going to begin together with the different campuses um, from 5 to 7 at the LaGrange campus, just for people to get to meet each other and hang out, and the students can kind of get to know each other. Um, they're going to like paint some shirts and stuff like that, hopefully they'll know the team color by then, uh, but it's going to be a great time for them to set up to get to know the different people in their dorms, stuff like that. It's going to be an excellent time. That's 5 to seven. We know not everybody lives in this neighborhood, and we want to do a hangout anyway, so Jen and I are also going to, Jen and I are also going to have a hangout at our house from five to seven for everybody, not just the parents of the youth, um, but from five to seven. So everybody's invited to that. I'll give you the address afterwards. I don't share that online. Uh, so, uh, but we'll let you know that afterwards, and I'll, it's just a potluck. You know, let's bring some stuff and everything. We'll supply the main dish, and we'll let you guys bring some things. It's going to be a fun time uh, at our house, which is like three blocks away from here. Uh, so we'll let you know that about that. Like I said, afterwards, after we shut that down, I'll tell you guys the address. And uh, it'll be a fun, fun time. So we look forward to these different hangouts. We're going to have different hangouts throughout the summer at different people's homes and also here at the church. So we'll let you know every week uh, kind of what's going on with that so you can understand that as well. Last but not least, a big hangout that we're going to be doing is going to be on July 16th. Everybody say July 16th. All right, July 16th, we're going to be doing a big hangout. Also, we're doing a baptism, uh, which is awesome. If you have not been baptized as an adult, I want to encourage you. If you are following Jesus, that is a big thing. You might say, well, I got baptized as a kid. That was good for your parents, but you didn't make that decision. And the Bible is clear that baptism is a decision you make when you say, I am deciding to follow Jesus. I have made that decision. My parents haven't made it for me. Nobody else has made it for me. I have made that decision. Then we get baptized. And so we're going to have a class about that next Sunday right after service, just talking about baptism. So if you are curious about it, if you've not gotten baptized as an adult, um, we, are, we do allow kids to get baptized if they know what they're doing. So we're not saying that there's an age requirement, but they have to know what they're doing because that's what the Bible says. So that's what we do with that. Makes some odd sense to do it the Bible, the biblical way, right? Uh, so I want to encourage you. You might say, well, I, you know, I've been saved for 10 years. My favorite baptism story of all time was we had a lady in the church I was at before. She was probably in her 80s. And this lady was amazing. Her name was Dr. Ann. She was awesome. She was bohemian. She was cool. She was like the first female doctor in her field. And also, she was just an amazing woman. And she came to know God, and she's like, I don't need to get baptized. God knows my heart. I'm fine. And she said that for many, many years. And so finally in her 80s, she went over to the pastor and said, you know what? I've been praying, and God put on my heart. And I said, I, I've got to stop being rebellious, and i got to actually follow the scriptures. So she went and she got baptized. So we had this wonderful 80-year-old woman who went under the water, and my wife and I were some of the only ones in the church that knew what was going to happen and, uh, because we knew her very, very well. And right when she went into the water, her hair stayed on the top of the water. <laughs> and she grabbed it, and she held it up in such a great victory, and it was the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, so you are never too old. You are never too young, you know, as long as you have fallen God. I said, greatest baptism story ever, right? Uh, so, you know, so definitely... Make sure you get involved in that. If you have any questions, again, we'll have a class next Sunday. Don't want to miss that. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for, God, what you're doing. For, God, how you've changed lives, how people have said that they want to follow you. God, and we want to celebrate that in the way that you have us celebrate that, which is through baptism, through showing people publicly on the outside what has already happened on the inside. God, I pray as we celebrate that day with baptisms and having food and hanging out, God, that we would just see that celebration, God, of just rejoicing over what you are doing. God, we're amazed at how you've touched people's lives, 
how you're going to continue to touch people's lives. God, and we give you all the honor and glory. We pray that you would speak to us in a great way today. We thank you so much in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, I'm excited. It's been two weeks since I've touched a pulpit, and that's weird for me. So I'm going to try not to be over-energized uh, on this and speak like a million miles a minute. Uh, I will try not to. You can all go like this if I talk too fast. You, Jen is up there, so she usually does that for me. So you now all have permission, okay? Like, some of you are going to do that the entire service. Anyway, uh, so, uh, I want to encourage you on July 4th weekend, there's a thing called the Stamp Act that helped to start a lot of the revolution. Now, the Stamp Act happened basically because uh, England said, well, we want some more money out of the colonists because we've helped out to fight some wars, and so we want to get some more money out of them. And the colonists said, well, why don't we get a say in what you're taking from us? You know, you're saying you want more money from us, but you're not even asking us. We're not even a part of this conversation. You're just telling us to do a bunch of things. They also had trials without juries and some other things like this that helped to start the revolution. In fact, they had a new cry that said, no taxation without representation. It was a very big cry, and it rhymes so everybody could remember it. And this helped them to start focusing on other freedoms they were missing by not having representatives. They said, we're missing something big by not having this. Now, we still see this in the U.S. and other places in the world where people are looking for representation, looking for others to speak on their behalf. But if we think about it, this is something that is very big in the Bible as well, wanting someone to speak on our behalf, having representation. We see this in the Old Testament in Job 16.21. It says this, I need someone to meditate between God and me as a person mediate, sorry, mediate, not meditate. <laughs> I need someone to mediate between God and me as a person mediates between friends. This is a very, very big thing. Why is, why is Job saying this? Job is saying this. He says, well, God is holy. He is set apart. He is different than anything else. He is over here. Mankind is sinful. We are over here. There's this gap that is separating us, and I need someone to be able to speak on my behalf because I can't go to him directly. I know that I am sinful. I know that I am fallen. I know that I have all these issues, and I can't go to him directly, so I need someone else to go for me, and I'm looking for someone to be my representative to come over there on this time. And this is a big part of what you're looking at. I mean, kind of a way of us to think about is none of us could probably approach the president. So we have representatives that speak on our behalf. But imagine if you had a personal representative that was able to speak to the president and talk in politics on your behalf. Like someone who would say, I have this power that I'm willing to be able to speak directly to them and get something done. Well, we'd be really happy about that. We're like, wow, all this personal stuff that I'm dealing with, you know, this person can really speak out for this and move with this. This is an exciting thing. They would be really happy about that. And that's the part of the priest's job in the Old Testament. The priest's job was to be that person who was in between the sinful person and the holy God. That was that priest's job to say, I'm going to help out to go in between, to help to mediate in between us. So this is described in Hebrews chapter 5. If you want to turn to Hebrews, we're going to be in there today. Hebrews found in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 5 says this. Every high priest is a man chosen to represent other people and their dealings with God. He presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifices for their sins. And he's able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people because he himself is subject to the same weakness. That is why he must offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for others. So what the high priest would do once a year, and his biggest part that he would do, uh, is once a year, the priest would go into what's called the Holy of Holies, a place that represented God on earth, the inner part of the temple. So he would go there once a year into that area. After he goes to that one year, first of all, he would wash himself and put on new clothes. This is the first part of the ceremony. He would wash himself and put on new clothes. Why was that the case? Well, just as Hebrews said, he was subject to the same weaknesses. He himself had his own sins, his own issues that he was dealing with. So he would show that in himself. And then he would sacrifice a bull for his sins and his family's sins. So he would say, okay, I know not only am I going to wash myself on the outside because I'm not worthy to go in front of God, and not only am I going to change my clothes because I'm not worthy to go in front of God, I know that I've sinned, I know my family has sinned, so I'm going to kill this bull to represent the sadness I have for what I've done in the past. Then there would be two different goats they would take. One goat they would kill to sacrifice to represent all 
the different, different people's sins. So this would represent everybody's sins. They would have another goat that they would let go called the scapegoat. In case you're ever wondering where that term came from, that's the scapegoat. Um, who would represent all their sins and that one would leave. It'd be like, okay, the sin's leaving the camp. So that's what that would represent. So they had the two different goats, one that would die, one that would get to get away. And then after that, he would wash up again and the ceremony was done. There was a ton of representation that was done here between the washing up, showing the, the priest's own ignorance and his waywardness, just as Hebrews 5 talked about, um, to the bull, showing that his family had just as much sin as anybody else, to the goat that died, showing the, the sacrifice and the harshness that was there, to the one that got to escape, to the clean up again. It's important to see all his representations. See, the death showed the seriousness of sin, and the priest showed our separation due to sin. So it's a very big way of helping everybody to understand this chasm that was there between us and God. It's saying this is such a big thing that there has to be death of an animal that they would see. It wasn't like, okay, here's some animal I just bought. All right, here you go. Now this get, no, it was an animal they had to raise. They had to be close with to understand the, how serious sin is. It's a very, very big thing that God wants us to understand the seriousness of continuing to do our own thing. And then the priest showed our separation. They had to wash up. They had to put new clothes. They had to make a sacrifice for themselves. The people weren't going in there. No, only the priests could go in there. So showing that separation that we had. And this representation helped the people to understand sin and its costs so they wouldn't casually continue to make up their own morals. So it's very easy for us to do that. One of the, the leaders of our uh, denomination, our, our state, said something about a month ago that I really thought was pretty impactful. He said, yes, we're called that we can boldly go in front of the throne of God, and we are called to do that, but we forget it's by the blood of Jesus that we're able to do that in the first place. And there's a lot of times we can forget that. We're really good on doing the boldly part. You're like, all right, God, let me talk to you. And forgetting the sacrifice that God made. See, the people in Israel, they couldn't forget this because they would actually see the animal. They would see the blood. They would see the sacrifice. They would understand this and say, this is something big. I can't casually continue on in my sin anymore. I have to say that there has to be a difference. And we have to look at this. This is what this was seen. Now, this was not a perfect system. And the passage today talks about what God did with it, showing that it wasn't a perfect system. If you want to turn to Hebrews 7, that's where we're going to be today. Hebrews 7, verse 18 says this. Yes, the old requirement about priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law never made anything perfect. But now we have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. Now, these words to you might just be like, oh, okay, that's, that's interesting. That's some, some verses. This was radical. So first of all, Hebrews was written to, I know this is going to blow everybody away, Hebrews. I, I know, that's, that's amazing. We, you know, we have to really think deep about this. But it was written to Jewish people. And it's saying, look, this is a system that you followed your entire life. This is a system our ancestors followed their entire lives. And everything is now shifting. Why? Because that system wasn't good. That system never did it. In fact, look at the language it uses. It is weak and useless. Our representatives, our priests, that whole system is weak and useless. This was radical to them. They're like, no, 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 this is all we know. This is our representative. We can't go to God. This priest is the only one who can go to God because we can't do it on our own. And now they're hearing it's weak and useless. This was radical for, to them. See, they were taught, if I follow the law and I have a priest talk to God for me, I'm good with God. Anybody know people who have been taught that? If I follow the, what the Bible tells me to say, I have this person talk to God for me, everything is great. Right? I think we all know people who have been taught that way. You know, maybe it's not a priest. Maybe if the pastor prayed for me or my mom prays for me or whatever, just put that other person in that place. But if I try to be a good person and if this person's praying for me, everything's great. You know, and we can all look into that in our lives and look, whatever that representative might be. It might be a mom, might be a grandmother, it might be a dad, it might be whoever else. If that person's praying for me and I'm trying to be a good person, I'm okay. That's kind of what our community feels. You talk to most people. You know, oh yeah, I'm trying to be a good person. You know, I'm, I'm a good person, and, you know, and I have people praying, and I'm praying, you know, and that's it. And you're like, but God doesn't have grandkids. He has only children. That's a saying I always heard when I was a kid, and it never made more, and always something that I think that a lot of people that I grew up with kind of forgot. Because they were in church like I was, and their parents were praying and everything else like that, and then a lot of us walked away from God, and we're like, oh yeah, I'm okay because my parents are praying for me. 
Yet we grew up hearing God doesn't have grandchildren, he only has children. But we're like, oh yeah, but they're praying for me. They're now my priest. They're my representative. That's not how it works. You know, God's like, no, no, there's something greater, there's something bigger. That system is weak and useless. And think of what else the verse says. The law never made anything perfect. It's like if you're trying to follow the Bible, have fun. You can't. To follow the entirety of the law in the Old Testament, there is no person alive that can do it. In fact, there's been uh, two different individuals that wrote different books that tried to follow the, all the laws in the Old Testament for a year, and they all said it was impossible. And they tried everything they could. They set aside their entire schedule, did all this other kind of stuff. They're like, it was impossible because I saw my mind starting to go to places and all this other stuff. They went, it is utterly impossible. What did the law do? The law was a mirror showing our sin. That's what the law is. It's saying, hey, this is where you should be going. Here's where you're at. Allow God to help you to start to go towards that direction. That's what the law does. We don't disregard it and say, well, I can't do anything about it. I can't follow it, so I'm just going to forget about it. No, we say, this is the area that God's guiding me to, and this is what I need help in. It's going to show me this parts, like I said, like a mirror, just saying, okay, these are some things that I need to look at. God, help me to work on these things. And so this is a big part, important part of the law. He's saying it never made anything perfect. It's just that mirror. We might say, well, that's where the priest comes in, right? He's our representative to God. We can't follow the law. We can't do that. So the priest comes into that place. But again, the Bible says the priesthood was weak and useless. That representative didn't work for us. It never was meant to be a thing that happened altogether. So if you look in that word in the Greek, weak means insufficient. They lacked what was needed. They lacked what was needed. That priest was never going to be enough and then useless means unprofitable. There is no benefit. Why is that? Let's look back again in Hebrews 7, verse 20. This new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath. But there was an oath regarding Jesus. For God said to him, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break this vow. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees the better covenant with God. Let's pause for a second. So he's saying, okay, the old system was you had this individual who was your representative. In the new system that God set up, which is a better system, Jesus is now your representative. He is now your priest. It continues on. There were many priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lives lasts forever. He's saying the problem with the old priesthood was sometimes you'd have some good priests. You'd have some Samuels. You had some other people like that. There were some really good priests that were some good representatives for the people. But the vast majority of them were bad priests. The vast majority of them were doing stuff for money. They weren't even caring. They were saying, yeah, you don't need to follow that part of the law. Do whatever you want to do. They were giving false prophecies, saying everything's going to be fine. When God was like, no, no, you all need to change your ways. You guys are keep on sinning. You keep on doing this thing. And they're like, no, it's fine. God's fine with it all. Who cares? Like, these are the priests they were dealing with. So he's saying that system was weak and useless. Why? Because of who the representative could be. That person could always be a good person, could be a bad person. But even if they were a good person, they were going to die. And even if they were a good person, again, just as we read in, in Hebrews 5, they still were subject to the same weaknesses and stuff that we deal with. They still deal with sin. They still had to clean themselves up. They still had to had put on those new clothes. They still had to kill a bull for their sins. They still had to do all these things. No matter what, they were going to be weak and useless. No matter what, they could not fill the role of the representative that they needed to fill. That they, needed to fill. they couldn't do that. If you think about it, priests are insufficient because they're human, but Jesus is a perfect representative because he is God. That's the difference. See, on our own, we are insufficient. On our own, we are not enough. On our own, we are just human, but Jesus is a perfect representative because he is God. He's not subject to the same weaknesses that we have. Why? Because he never sinned. He's not subject to the same kind of issues that we had of going through the same things. No, why? Because he is God. It is something very, very different. We need to have our minds open and say, I have to stop trusting in men, and I need to start trusting in God. Because I think a lot of us know people that are trusting in men over trusting in God. I think that's, a lot of us can easily see that. I had a friend of mine who's a pastor and. And we were on a road trip one time going to, uh, uh, to a seminary class. 
and we were going down, and his phone kept on blowing up every five seconds. So I was like, man, it's the same person who texts He goes, oh, it's different people. It kept on blowing up, blowing up, blowing up. I'm like, dude, what is going on, man? Your phone is like nonstop. He's like, oh, well, you know, this person's dealing with this, this person's dealing with this, this person's dealing with this. And it's not that people weren't dealing with stuff, but it, a lot of it was the same kind of things. I'm like, haven't you told them that they can go to God? That they don't have to talk to you all the time? Now, as a pastor, that does not mean I don't want you to text me, okay? Don't, don't anybody take that away from this. Pastor JJ says, do not text him. I did not say that in this sermon, okay? No, it's important for us to know what's going on so we can pray for you. That's a good thing. But what's more important is that you go to God first. What's more important is that you seek him more than you seek me or anybody else. All right? Because there's a lot of times where we can look around and say, well, you know what? I need this person really helps me out. And that's great that God puts people in our lives. That's a great part of being a church family. But if we don't go to God first, we're missing it. We're missing it. Why? Because a person can never take the place of Jesus. He is the perfect representative. He is the perfect priest. He is the only one who can do that. I mean, prayer is important. We're called to pray together as individuals. Prayer encourages us and fuels our faith together when we come together. It is a powerful thing. But we can't forget it's Jesus who does the work. Yes, we're encouraged. Our faith is fueled. These are important things. And that's why we come together for prayer. That's why we come together and we pray for one another. That's why that's important. But Jesus is the one who actually does things. He's the only representative with any power. So you might say, well, what does it look like to have Jesus as our representative? Let's go back to Hebrews 7. Verse 25 says this. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. He is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners that has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. This is a very crucial sermon for those who haven't felt that they've been born again. What what do I mean by this? A feeling is something we as Westerners look for a lot. Now, we are emotion and we are logic. We are so many different things as humans. I don't knock feelings. But if we're feeling I have to feel saved all the time to be saved, we're missing something. We are missing something. And, you know, the moment that we come to Jesus, I love what it says right, right at the very beginning. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. If you say, I am giving him my life, he is the Lord of my life, I believe in who he is, I believe he came, died, and rose again. If you believe that, you are saved. You are now following God. You are on that path. You are on that journey. That is great. You don't have to continue to say, well, you know what? I messed up, so now I must not be saved anymore. I used to think all the time when I was a kid, they used to ask downstairs, just as we asked um, upstairs, we would ask, does anybody want to follow the Lord? Does anybody want to give their life to the Lord? And every week I was raising my hand. Every week. And finally the, the children's pastor came up to me and was like, what? why are you raising your hand every week? You know, like, what's, what's going on? I was like, well, you know, I, I lied to my sister. You know, I did this. And they're like, yeah, and you need forgiveness from that from God, which he can give you, but you didn't lose your salvation. That was something I didn't realize. I thought as soon as, okay, well, I'm on this path with God, but then I made this decision. Now I'm totally off this path. Now God doesn't happen with me anymore, and now I'm gone. I had that feeling. Why? Because I didn't look at verses like this. Once and forever, we're able to be saved from him. You might be saying, well, yes, Jesus gave up his life once and forever, but I constantly mess up and need his help. Anybody ever felt that way? You ain't raising your hand. You're lying. All right. <laughs> all right. We're all there. We're all there together. So what does Jesus do on our behalf? It says he intercedes for us. Now, I had always been um, taught that interceding, it meant like being in a courtroom, because that's kind of how that word is used. And so this is kind of how the picture was painted for me, is that you would have Satan, the accuser, who would come over and say, hey, this is all the stuff that JJ is doing, you know, kind of in the courtroom of heaven, and looking at God the Father saying, all right, this is what JJ has done. He's done this, 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 and this, and he's a worthless human being, okay? And then Jesus would be on the other side and say, yeah, I know he did all those things, but I forgave that, and so it's okay. All right, and that was it, and then God was like, all right, well, Jesus took care of that, everything's fine. That's how I thought interceding worked. That was kind of my dumbed-down idea of, of how that worked. And so every single time that I sinned, I'm like, okay, now, all right, Satan's out there, and he's yelling at me, and he's yelling at me, and saying all this stuff that I did, and Jesus having to go up there again, and be like, 
All right, all right. Yeah, I know JJ did the same stupid thing again. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. But remember, I did die. So, you know, let's just, you know, and then Jesus was just getting more and more frustrated because every single day he'd be like, okay, Satan, Jesus, yeah, again. And then I'm thinking, man, not only does he have to do that for me, he's doing that for everybody. Like, he's got to be tired, frustrated, and annoyed. You know, like, that's kind of how I thought about it, and that's how I thought interceding worked, um, because I'd been heard the, the courtroom terms. But the problem is, nobody ever broke down the word for me, and so I was totally ignorant. See, the word there actually, the, the, the root word of the word that they use there in Greek for intercede actually means to make the mark, to make the mark. Now, you might say, why is that important? Well, allow me to help you. All right, so to make the mark, in other words, so J.J., this is the path that you're supposed to be going on. I decide to go this way. That's called missing the mark. That's the word we use in Greek for sin. I was supposed to go this way. I decide to go this way. I missed the mark. So this word for interceding is I'm going to help to personally guide them to help to make the mark. That's very different. They're going up every single day and saying, yeah, they, he messed up. Yeah, I'm sorry. I took care of that. He's an idiot. That's very different than saying, yes, he went this way. I'm going to help to personally guide him back and pray him back and speak him back to the right place. That's different. And that's what Jesus does when he intercedes for us. And I think a lot of us miss that. I think a lot of us see Jesus as being this frustrated lawyer who's just so upset saying, I have to pray for you again. I have to be your priest again for the same stupid thing again and again. I have to do that versus someone who's personally coming up and saying, I know that you're going this way, but this way is so much better for you. Let me, let me show you the path that you really need to take. Let me guide you in the way that you ultimately want to go. Help me, allow me to help to change your thinking so you can make these different decisions. Allow me to help to guide your steps instead of you just saying, well, this is the way I feel right now, instead of saying, this is the way I need to go. Him personally coming along. You see how that's very, very different. I think so many of us miss this, and we come with such a, a bad view of God. So when we sing songs like, who am I? We say, yeah, who am I? Why should I be able to go to God? Why should I be able to? Because you know what? I, I've messed up again and again and again. I keep doing the same stupid thing again and again. So who am I that I can actually talk to God? But then we see this beautiful vision of Jesus coming and saying, I'm interceding for you. I'm guiding you back to the mark that you want to be. It's a very different thing. I hope this encourages every single person here. Because I think Satan has messed with all of our heads in this. That who are you? Who are you to continue to do the same thing? Who are you to continue to have the same thoughts? Who are you to continue to go that same direction? Who are you? And to continue to argue that through and through instead of seeing who he is, we kind of try to concentrate on who we are. But we need to see him for who he is as he's interceding for us. It's very, very different. I mean, I love how this is shown in Luke 22, verse 31. This is very big. This is right at a time where Jesus had just told the disciples, you know, you guys are going to, you know, someone's going to betray me, and you guys are all going to flee and leave me. And Peter comes up, because Peter's always a very big one, to talk with emotion right away, and he says, I'm never going to leave you. It's never going to happen. I got you all the way. Never going to be a problem. And Jesus says this, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat, but I have pleaded in prayer for you. Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. This is Jesus interceding for Peter, showing us an example of what he does in heaven. This is such a beautiful thing of showing this. Oh, this, this, this uh, phrase here, pleading in prayer, it means to have a deep personal need. Jesus doesn't just come alongside us and intercede for us and guide us back to that right path because he has to, because it's his job, because he's Jesus. It's very, very different. He does it out of love and out of care. Jesus has a deep personal need to deliver our personal needs to the Father. He has this great love for you. He has this great need to say, I see that you're going this direction, and I care too much about you to let you continue to go in that direction. It's like if you saw a kid walking out to the street. You would care enough to get that kid out of the way. You would care enough saying, I won't, don't want this kid getting hurt. That's that same part, that same need. But Jesus did it to the point where not only does he guide us over there, he took the blows for our sins to show that love that he has for us to say, I want to help you to go that other direction and I'll take the hits so you can actually go where you need to go. 
it's a beautiful thing. We see this happening with Peter where he's saying, I want to help you out. See, it's important for us to understand what Hebrews is talking about when it's talking about our representative. Priests weren't emotionally invested. It was a priest's job to do that. But it's Jesus' passion to actually be our priest. Very different. It's not Jesus' job. Well, I have to intercede for him. I have to go in the middle. That was a priest's job. Whether they were a good priest or a bad priest, they were born into that family line, that's what you got to do. I got to be the intercedent for the people and God. I got to help them out. This is my job. It wasn't like that. It was Jesus saying, no, this is my passion. I care about this to guide people out. I mean, think about it. Jesus knew Peter's flaws and still said those words. Jesus knew exactly what Peter was about to do. And for those of you who might not be familiar with the story, Peter was going to see Jesus on trial in front of the religious leaders. See him getting slapped, hit, blindfolded, and people saying, now prophesy, who hit you? And beating him, pulling out his beard. They got to see all that kind of stuff. He's sitting there watching Jesus getting hurt and saying, okay, uh, what am I going to do? Freaking out. And then a little slave girl comes up to him and says, oh, hey, aren't you with him? And he goes, oh, no, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. Then he walks away and, and she comes back in, hey, uh, no, I really think you are because you have the same accent. And he's like, no, 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 not me. And then somebody else, no, no, I really think you're with him. And he's like, you know, curse me if I say that. It denies him and Jesus is right there. Jesus knew this was going to happen. But what does he do? He intercedes for him. Why? Because he's passionate. It's not his job. It's his passion. Say, no, no, I'm still going to intercede for you. I'm still going to pray for you. I know you're going to miss the mark, but I'm still wanting to guide you back to the right mark. That's how much I care about you. That's how much I love you. That's how much I want to see you succeed. I'm willing to say, I know your flaws, but you know what? My favor over you is better than your flaws. And that's what he does. And that's an amazing thing to see. It's a beautiful thing to see him coming back. If you think about it, after the resurrection, Peter seems to feel that he messed up way too much. He goes back to fishing. He goes back to his old job. He thinks, you know what, I, I've messed up. I've done way too wrong. And please look at this later in John 21. Um, please look that up during this week so you can get even more enriched by this story. But in John 21, we see Peter just going right back to fishing, thinking, well, you know what? Jesus is resurrected, and that's an amazing miracle, and that's great. But you know what? I mess up too much. I missed that mark so much. I'm so far over here. I denied him right when he needed me the most. That I'm so much over here. I might as well continue to go down this direction. I'm going to love him, but I can't really be used by him. You know, I'm going to care that he rose, and that's awesome, and that's great. You know, and I believe in what he could do for others, but he can't do anything with me because I did too much. And so he's walking away, and he goes back fishing, and then he sees Jesus on the shore, and he gets out, and I love, because again, Peter's an emotional guy, he just goes with his gut, and he's like, just jumps out of the boat and starts swimming. Like, he doesn't wait for them to come back, he's like, oh, okay, Jesus, I'm just going there. So he goes back over there and sees them, and he hangs out, Jesus grills some fish, it's fun. You know, they're hanging out, and we see Jesus personally pull Peter aside here in John 21. He says to him three different times, do you love me? Now, if he would have just said that, that would have been where a lot of us ended. All right, Jesus, do I love you? Yes, I love you. I know I messed up a lot, but I love you, and I thank you for what you did. I'm so grateful for what you did. I'm so grateful for what you did on the cross. I'm so grateful for you interceding and, and helping people go back to the mark. I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for your love. A lot of us would end it there, but that's not where Jesus ended it. He said, then feed my sheep. Then feed my lambs. And they get involved again. What was he telling him when he's saying, feed my sheep? He's like, get back into the game. Don't feel that you did so much that you can't go back. Don't feel that you did so much that of missing the mark that you can't go back to that mark. I can guide you. Why? Because I interceded for you. I guide you through. I'm your representative. I'm the one who's guiding you back to this area, and you can't mess up too much that I can't save you. And Peter needed to see that. And many people in this room need to see that. You can't mess up too much that God can't save you. And your neighbors, your family members, people in our community, they can't mess up too much that God can't save them. It's important for them to know as well. This is so crucial for those who need to know there is more than forgiveness in Jesus. A lot of times that's what we chalk up Jesus to. Well, if you need forgiveness from your sins, see Jesus. That's your priest. You need him to do that, that's your representative. 
Have him go to, the God, go to God for you. And you can say, hey, Jesus, here you go. Here's the stuff I'm dealing with. And we go, all right, cool. Let me talk to the Father and everything's great. Now, there's so much more. He prays for you. He intercedes for you. He's guiding you. He's believing in you. What is he doing? He's praying over your purposes. He's praying over your passions. He's praying as you're reaching out and your interactions with other people. He's lifting you up, guiding you towards that place that you ultimately want to be. This is what Jesus is doing right now in heaven. This is what he's doing for you and for me. And it's important that we know that. So we just chalk Jesus up to just forgiveness and that's it. We're missing him in our daily lives. We can't miss that. He has so much more for us. Amen? So Jesus prays over us. What does he pray over us? I think he prays over us the same kind of things he prayed over Peter. Let's look again at what he says to Peter. He prays that our faith will not fail. He prays that our faith will not fail, that our faith will be strengthened. I still think of a, a guy back in Mark whose son was demon-possessed, and the disciples were praying over him, and the kid could not be set free. And, and the man comes over to Jesus, and he goes, hey, if you can heal him, then please do that. And Jesus looks at him and goes, if? You know, like, thanks for insulting, Jesus. You know, <laughs> like, do you know who you're talking to? And the man says this wonderful words, I believe, but help my unbelief. Yeah, I know that you can do things, but I don't know if you can do things. A lot of us need Jesus to pray that over us, right? I know you can do anything, but can you do this? Yes. And Jesus is going to pray over that, help to strengthen that our faith will not fail. Then we see that we will repent, that we will change our thinking. We will never follow the law perfectly. It's important for us to know that. But God can help to change our thinking, which is what repentance means. Change your thinking to change your actions. He can change our thinking so we can go back to the right way that we need to go. And that's a life long thing that we need to continue to pray about and say, God, help me when I'm looking in the Bible. Let me see the mirror. And even when I don't want to see, I don't, I don't like that. You know, we can look into the mirror and see things that we don't like. But God's like, no, these are things that need to be changed. It's okay. Don't feel bad about it. Be encouraged that you're going to be having a new day. You're going to be having a new direction that you're going to be going. Be encouraged by the word, not insulted by the word. Allow it to actually move you forward. That's what Jesus prays over us too, that we will have that mindset. Pray that we will strengthen others. That we will be bold enough to say, it's not just me and Jesus. God cares for everybody. He's wanting to use me. Yes, you. You who might feel like you're like Peter. Yes, I love you and that's about it. And you say, no, no, feed my sheep. I, I want you to do something more in your life. I've, I've given you opportunities to do something more in your life. Right where you're at, you can reach people that nobody else can reach. You know people I will never meet in my entire life. When I said, well, pastor, that's your job. That's your job. You are royal priesthood. That's who you are. That's what the Bible calls you. You are missionaries. That's who you are. You are called to reach out to others. And that might scare you, but it's okay because it's not you doing it by yourself. It's the Holy Spirit in you working through you. And that's exactly what Peter was saying. I got to go back fishing because you know what? I failed. I messed up. I'm not good enough. I can't do it. I showed it. At the time, Jesus needed me the most. I failed him. But no, Jesus right away says, no, no. Allow me to intercede. Allow me to guide you back so you can get to the mark where you want to be. And God wants to guide you back to the mark where you want to be as well. Amen? As Cameron comes up, there's different things that you might be needing today, personally, that God might have spoken to you through his word. But one thing I want you to know is exactly who your representative is so you can actually be calling out to the one who can help you. I want us to look again, Hebrews 7, verse 26. It says, he is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless. Unstained by sin, he has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. See, Jesus is holy. He's unlike anyone else. I talked to a lady in our congregation who just was told that she had stage four cancer this last week. And that's a hard thing to hear, obviously. And I love the words that she said. I just love the words she said. She goes, yes, you know, I know what the doctor said. I know what all these other things said, but they haven't met my Jesus. We need to increase our faith. You might be here and you might be saying, I need my faith increased today. And as we stand, I want to ask you to do something with your, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here saying, I need God to increase my faith. Yes, I believe, but help my unbelief. 
I need Jesus to pray that over me today. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. See your hand. Awesome. If you're here today, he says as well in that verse, that he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He's been set apart from sinners. Jesus never sinned. He can guide us in our repentance. If you're here and I have my eyes closed, just between you and God, you're saying, God, I really need you to help to change my thinking so I can change my actions. I want you just to raise your hand. God, help me to change my thinking so I can change my acting. I need Jesus to pray over that over me. Last one for today. He's given the highest place of honor in heaven. What does that mean? He has this great power. He can help us to reach out to others. How many of you need more power to be strengthened to help to reach out to others? Go ahead and raise your hand. God, we've had many different people who've raised their hands. But before we go any further, we need to ask the ultimate question, which is how many people need you as their representative in the first place? Maybe you were like some of my friends when we were younger and you had a mom or a priest or a grandmother or somebody else who was that representative to God for you. You say, you know, I've, I've tried to be a good person. These people are praying for me. Therefore, everything should be fine. The Bible would say that system is useless. It's weak and it's useless because it's not a personal relationship that you have with God that we only get as Jesus as a representative by saying, Jesus, you are Lord. I am following you. I'm not following anyone else. I'm not looking for a parent to be following you. I'm not looking for a grandparent to be following you, but I want to be following you. I believe you came, you died, you rose again, and I want to give you my life today. I want you to be my representative, to be my priest today. If that's you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to raise your hand. We want to pray for you today. Stand here. God, I want to start with prayer for those who just said, I want to start to follow you. I'm not looking for anybody else to be in that gap, not a priest, not a mom, not a grandmother, not a a good friend. But Jesus, you are the only high priest. You are our only representative, God, that could bring us close to the Father. We pray right now that you will be Lord of our lives. God, that we'll be following what you have to say. Man will fail us. God, you won't. So God, we want to follow you. We know we're going to make some mistakes, but that's so beautiful to know you intercede for us. You guide us back to the mark. We will miss the mark, but you will help to guide us back. We are so grateful for that. We are so grateful that you came, that you died, that you took those blows for us, but that you rose again, giving us the power to be able to fight every single day and to see change happen every single day so grateful for the new lives that are found in you. We thank you so much in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I was at a church in Orlando last week. Yes, I go to church on vacation. That's a good thing. (laughs) But I was over there, and they did something different for their altar call, and I totally dug, and I told Jen right afterwards, I'm stealing it, and I'm doing it today. If you raise your hand for any one of those three things, I want you to come down front. Like, literally now raise your hand for any one of those things. Come on down. There's so many times that when we say, if you just want prayer, come on down and we all get nervous. Like, I don't want anybody thinking everything. No. If you want prayer, we're asking you to come down. Go ahead. You can fill into the sides and stuff. If you didn't raise your hand, you want to raise your hand, go ahead and come up here. If you want prayer for something else, that's fine too. Well, we're going to spend some time with our high priest today. We're going to spend some time just talking to Jesus. This is where I'm at. And again, we can go boldly to the throne, Romans says. We can go boldly there. We have Jesus interceding for us, guiding us. No matter how much we've seen, this is the direction I've been going, he's guiding us back over. Whether it's helping us to boldly share, whether it's helping us to change our mindset, whether it's helping us to have more faith when we need to see that. I know there's different things I need all the time. I'll be raising my hand for these things at different times, at different times of the week. So we're going to have the time of prayer. If you would like to come down, feel free to come down. Let's spend some time with Jesus. Let's just talk to our high priest, our intercessor. 
And let's just go to God directly. Amen.